The Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network presents Worldview Media Podcast, where Gordon and Joyce Runyon view popular media through the lens of the biblical five-point covenant model to help believers appreciate and apply principles of exciting narrative and engaging storytelling. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the Worldview Media Podcast. My name is Gordon Runyon. I'm the pastor of Emmanuel Baptist Church in Tucumcari, New Mexico. My normal podcast partners are in Denver, Colorado for a national 4-H competition. And so uh, we we got a, a good deal. We got a near celebrity friend of mine to come on the podcast and and we're going to talk about a movie together. With me by phone is the host of the War Room on Reconstructionist Radio Network, my friend and brother Bill Evans. Bill, welcome. Thank you for getting on with us. Thank you, Gordon. I'm excited about this week's show. <laughs> yeah, I, spoiler alert, this is, am I right, this is your favorite movie? <laughs> Hands down. Hands down. All right, good deal. We're talking about the movie Gods and Generals. So this movie's uh, going on 15 years old. I think it was 2003, is that right? Something like that. And we both, or uh, Bill's watched the movie several times, the cinematic version, and I watched the director's cut on YouTube and... Man, that is a long movie, that director's cut. That's pushing four hours. <laughs> but uh, it's free. You can watch Gods and Generals for free on YouTube, and I'd say it's well worth the time. I told Bill I was going to challenge him. Maybe there are a lot of, maybe there are some folks out there like me who hadn't even really heard of this movie before Bill suggested it to me. And so, brother, I'm going to give you a couple of minutes. Do your best to sell people on why they should watch this movie. Well, thank you. Uh, you know, there uh, a lot of historical movies or movies that historic, uh, purport to be historical are really an exercise in at least mild revision. And I'm happy to say that in respect to Gods and Generals, which was the second movie done by... Uh, Maxwell, who uh, made Gettysburg, uh, this is the prequel. It basically covers uh, the history of uh, the war for Southern independence from the uh, outbreak and the declaration of, of secession and uh, through the Battle of Chancellorsville, uh, right, with, right, which was in uh, May of 1863 before Gettysburg which was in July of 1863. It's, it's, the movie is extremely accurate. Um, most of the, uh, of most of the, um, of the, of the lines, uh, that the actors, uh, give are, are virtually taken verbatim from eyewitness accounts. And, uh, of course it's, it's a little wooden in, in the respect that, um, most of the cast were volunteers, reenactors, oh, wow. and uh, and uh, used thousands of reenactors uh, who brought their own their own props uh, <laughs> with them, and right. uh, and so they're not they're not professional actors. Uh, uh, Stephen Lang, who plays uh, Stonewall Jackson, who many people know, was a very devout uh, Presbyterian. He was a Calvinist. His uh, his his Faith well, was very prominently displayed in the movie. Uh, a lot of references to the providence of God and all, and, and God is their father, and in Scripture and his his reliance upon Scripture and prayer. Uh, it, it, it's not just about warfare. There's a lot of uh, really tender scenes in the movie that will appeal to ladies, and it's what's what's very clear is that there was a that the, the, to say that all the men in the South were believers, obviously, would not be correct. But it was very much, as George Grant would say, sort of the last last example of Christendom, and where women womanhood was highly esteemed. 
and the women in the movie as they're portrayed, uh, both Jackson's wife and, uh, and, and uh, the Lacey family and others, there's a great deal of, um, of, of reverence and honor paid to them. And, and, and so it's, they're treated with real dignity and respect. So I think the ladies will find something in it as well, not to mention the fact that it does portray a man who lived his faith and was not ashamed of the gospel. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, I was thinking how refreshing it was to watch a movie that was not only honest when it came to portraying a man exercising his faith, but uh, it, it was. it almost seemed to me like whoever made the movie was kind of on the side of the South. You know, they were heroes and, uh, and he didn't try to make them seem like something other than heroes. And, uh, I, I found that really refreshing. I don't know if you know, or, or you paid as much attention as, as some of us have, but like when, when any modern movie kind of portrays the civil war, uh, it's so black and white that the North is the good guys and the South are the bad guys. And, uh, it's just extremely irritating in that, in that respect. And so I thought it was really refreshing to have a movie from a guy who obviously had sympathy and, and, at least in some respects, was on the same page as Stonewall Jackson. Thought he was a good guy, and uh, so for me, I, I thought that was really. Uh, well, what was interesting is what was interesting is in that in one of the scenes you notice uh, Ted Turner uh, puts on a, a Confederate officer's uniform and is an extra uh, has a bit line in one of the scenes where they're having a concert. Uh, for the, uh, the basically like the Civil War version of the USO, right? The soldiers. And and of course, Ted Turner is certainly no friend of the gospel, right? And, and so it's re it's remarkable that he paid for a movie <laughs> that <laughs> that so that that put Jackson and Lee's faith out there uh, so prominently. Uh, uh, I guess it, that uh, demonstrates that even the wrath of, the wrath of men will praise him. Uh, <laughs> And, and the other thing is, is that what's uh, what's been talked about a lot. It's obviously been talked about forever, and it's being talked about a lot now among Reconstructionist circles. Is the issue of slavery, and I think it, I think it, um, it, it doesn't try to make a huge point about slavery. This is a story of a of an army, right. uh, but it, but it, it there is a very real sense in which. Um, there's a scene where Jackson uh, is talking with the, the black man who is his cook, who basically right. is his, uh, who, who tends to him personally. And, uh, and, and he re he's recruited and Jackson uh, in, the, in the list of requirements wants to know, does he fear God? And, um, and that's, that's very high on Jackson. In fact, that was at the top of his list of requirements is that um, he wanted a man who feared God. <laughs> right. And, and, uh, and later on, they have a discussion uh, in late at night about slavery. Yeah, and it, right. And it, and, and it gives, and, and the black man is asking the general, how is it that, that, that men can enslave their brothers? And it's very, it, it, I think what it portrays the fact is that these men were caught up in perilous times. It, it was, they were fighting for their very lives. Yeah, and uh, they probably were not in a position as soldiers to try to right every social wrong. <laughs> right, but they, right. But but they recognized that there was an issue. They recognized that it was it was difficult to understand. Uh, they and they and and Jackson basically said, "Well, you know, God will work this out." Yeah, that's right. That's right. Well, I'd like to come back to that when we get into our ethics section uh i want to there are a couple of questions i'd like to explore a little bit on that but i really thought those scenes were good i like what you were saying before i uh, when the movie started and it was showing stonewall jackson and and i've read enough to kind of recognize some of his quotes i was a little bit afraid that they were going to portray him in a wooden sort of two-dimensional way and 
So I was really happy for the few scenes that they have with his wife and the more intimate way that he's portrayed there. And you find out he's a man who's willing to confess his weaknesses and, and, uh, you know, kind of, kind of defer to his wife on a, on a couple of little issues and stuff. And I actually thought it was kind of humorous and, and really human. And so that was a storytelling uh, device that I really liked about that. Yeah, and, and 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 of course his relationship with Janie, uh, the little girl. Right. That was that that was a real relationship that actually happened in the uh, winter of eighteen sixty two, where uh, he befriended a little five year old girl who was the daughter of a uh, of a family that they were bivouacked with, right. and he grew very, they grew very became very fond of one another, <laughs> and she died of pneumonia, oh. and um, and it, it it broke him up. I mean, he he demonstrated more more human grief over the loss of that little five-year-old girl than he'd ever been, than he'd ever displayed in, in the midst of all the carnage of war. Sure. And so it was clear that he wore, you know, he had a facade. He wore, he had to be tough. Yeah. Uh, and yet when it, when it came to the, to the death of a little girl, uh, it, it, you know, his humanity broke through and, and it was very tender and as was his scenes with his wife. And the other thing that's interesting, I would say that if all uh, someone did was watch his death scene, um, yeah. Jackson's death scene is, is portrayed word for word. Oh, and wow. uh, and if anyone's not familiar with the narrative of it, it's worth watching just for that because you talk about uh, dying like a Christian. Oh, yeah. Uh, right. Right, that's that was an amazing that was an amazing scene for sure. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention for a movie that, from what you say, from what you've told me about it, it it kind of tried to get by without a big blockbuster sort of uh, budget. But I really enjoyed all the production value and stuff. The I think they did a good job portraying the chaos of battle, and it was genuinely scary at places, you know. Uh, the chaos was just, uh, you, wow, you could cut it with a knife. <laughs> yeah, it's important to note that in one, one of the battles portrayed in the, in the it did not make the, the, uh, the theater version, but is in the extended cut, uh, the Battle of Antietam, which was in uh, September of 1862, there were more casualties in one day than in the most uh, than in, in, in the, than in the entire Battle of Iwo Jima, the campaign wow. for Iwo Jima in the Pacific that lasted a month. Wow! So wow. in excess of thirty-two thousand casualties in one day, and most of this was at close range. My word. And uh, yeah. and um, so it, it, the, the, you're you're right. I mean, there there has probably never been fighting like that on. Well, certainly, uh, in American history, there's never been any kind of right. brutality uh, in any other war, like like in uh, in, in uh, the war between the states, and and, and particularly those camp that campaign. And what's also interesting to note is, in, in this, you may go into this in your second uh, part, but to to listen to Lee and Jackson's explanation of patriotism and their perception of their role and, and, and where their allegiance was. You know, what's interesting to note is that um, Lee, neither Lee nor Jackson ever, with the exception of a brief foray into Maryland for the battle where Sharpsburg or Antietam was fought, and then later after Jackson had already uh, passed away, uh, the, the Gettysburg campaign, Lee and Jackson's entire military career during this war, they both fought in the Mexican War and, and, and distinguished themselves, but their entire career was in the state of Virginia. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. And in fact, uh, Lee, uh, and they both explained that they loved the Union, but their allegiance was with their state. So they were they were little R Republicans. They, were, <laughs> they believed in a decentralized, they believed in a federal government that was decentralized sure. and state in state sovereignty so and it was clear that that's what that's what uh dictated their sense of duty was their state 
Right. I kind of got that reading uh, Jefferson Davis's history of the rise and fall of the Confederate states that 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 was that was kind of a common motivating factor for for those that were in the South. Their allegiance was to the states and. Uh, well, and in fact, and in fact, the, uh, the organization of their army was all by North and South <laughs> right. at that time. Was yeah. all by state. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's kind of shocking because now the states have just become uh, really nothing. It's just a geographical denomination, you know, and uh, it just it didn't start out that way, of course. <laughs> no, and, and early on in the movie, where um, where. Um, Jackson is speaking to a friend of his who's a who's a unionist and is moving to Pennsylvania to escape the the yeah. coming uh, onslaught. He explains. He said that we're that that what they're fighting for is not just uh, their survival, but it's to prevent the triumph of mercantilism and banking and, uh, yeah. and fascism, basically. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, you know what? That's one thing that I don't think anybody ever gets taught. You have to find that on your own by reading that there's so many issues that were at risk and fought over in that war that don't really have anything to do with slavery. And and the wrong side won <laughs> in all of those issues, you know. So. Well, one of the one of the common questions that anybody who is a Civil War buff or uncivil war, as I call it, buff, uh, yeah. asks is why why do you pr- propose that in the providence of God Jackson was taken? Because if you, if you follow the the trajectory of the, of the war, the South was on the ascendancy. Yeah. The ascendancy until Jackson died, and he was right. killed by friendly fire. Right. Well, right. he died from pneumonia, but he was he was wounded and effectively contracted pneumonia as a result of friendly fire. And after after Jackson passed away, uh, the South never. Although they had a few victories, Chickamauga and Coal Harbor and a few others, but they never really had a shot after Jackson was gone. Yeah, and of course that was due to the fact of the, the remarkable relationship he had with Lee, and he was also a galvanizing uh, leader. I mean, he was a. Uh, but often people ask, well, why do you suppose if if the North were basically represented, you know, transcendental and Unitarian and humanism and <laughs> big government and yeah. versus this 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 uh, Christian cultural South? Well. Pastor John Weaver, who's probably forgotten more about the war than most of us will ever know, <laughs> has, has postulated that it's that it was in judgment. Sure, that Jackson, absolutely. Jackson's death, Jackson's death, that that God spared. You know, and I forget what I was going to look it up in what Psalm it talks about how God uh, spares the godly. In uh, in other words, He takes them out of the way, yeah. so that they're not they're not caught up in the in the aftermath, in the judgment, and precious in the in the sight of the Lord is the death of His godly ones. And so he, yeah. he postulates that 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 Jackson's death uh, was to pr- bring about the defeat of the Confederacy as judgment, not only upon the South but upon the whole nation uh, for their apostasy, for uh, injustice uh, such as slavery, and uh, for having forsaken the opportunity to organize as a Christian as a self-proclaimed Christian republic. Yeah, exactly. Uh, interesting, so inter- yeah, interesting dynamics, and a lot of different underplots and things. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, uh, hopefully we'll get to address some of those. It's time for our break, and then when we get back, what we will do is run gods and generals under the microscope of the five-point biblical covenant, and we will see what kind of worldview is being preached. I don't think they were, I don't think this is going to be a hard one to discern like, like some media is, (laughs) but, uh, so let's take our break and we'll come right back. The reconstructionist radio podcast network brings to you a complete lineup of podcasts where you will hear practical and tactical theology. Our desire is not simply that you consume our shows, but that you also live out your faith in every area of life. 
We can talk all day long about these things, but if we fail to put them into practice, then we fail as ambassadors of Jesus Christ, our King. Subscribe now to your favorite Reconstructionist Radio podcast network shows, or you can subscribe to the Reconstructionist Radio Master Feed, where all of the content we produce, including the audiobooks and audio articles, will pop up as soon as they are available. And don't forget to visit reconstructionistradio.com to volunteer as a narrator or to partner with this ministry financially. May the Holy Spirit stir you into action for Christ and His Kingdom. And we're back. I'm Gordon Runyon. I'm joined by Bill Evans, the host of the War Room podcast, and we're talking about gods and generals. Uh, we like to take the media that we're talking about and compare it or use the biblical five-point covenant as a, as a means of kind of dissecting the worldview that's being preached. And the first point, the first point in the covenant is transcendence. Generally, here we ask the question, in this media that we're talking about, what does the media itself point to as the overarching power in terms of creation and redemption and law-giving? And a lot of the time, like I'm saying, that's sometimes hard to discern, but it isn't here, and that's one of the things that's refreshing, that constantly, as Bill has said, that uh, Stonewall Jackson is a main character, and you see him continuously referring to the sovereignty of God and to Scripture and constantly resorting to prayer. And uh, and as Bill has said, that's that's one of the high points of the movie, and it's it's not in one or two places. This is a thematic thing. And so the transcendent power that's clearly in this movie is the triune God of the Bible. I don't see how it could be any other way. You think I'm right about that? <laughs> There's no question. Even in, in, in fact, uh, you know, one of the scenes during the Battle of Fredericksburg, where which actually happened, in which Jackson and Pete Longstreet and uh, Robert E. Lee were bunched together, in a council of war, and a uh, artillery right. piece exploded. Yeah. And uh, and and Lee's in his actual words in that event were that, it, that they were protected by the providence of God; that it was not yet their time. Sure. Uh, yeah. And, and as 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 Lee as Jackson uh, did in a uh, in a, an exchange with one of his a couple of his uh, officers after the Battle of Manassas, where he explains that his it is his faith that teaches him that uh, it's appointed for a man to die once, and, and, and after that, the judgment, and that until God's time, he's indestructible. He's as safe on the battlefield as he is in his bed until right. God, right. And, he, and he says, God has appointed the time of my death. I don't worry about it. I just I just endeavor to always be ready. Exactly, and that's, that's historical, too. That's, like you said, a lot of what they attribute to Jackson's character there is historical, and uh, that's one of the things you'll read in really any biography of him is is that famous quote there. And the reason it comes out in the movie is because uh, one of the one of the members of the Southern Army is kind of standing there asking him, "How can you be so calm? I'm I'm terrified." <laughs> and and then he answers like that. So uh, that's I, that's one of the things I rejoice about in this movie is that the transcendent authority is so blatant and obvious. And, yeah. Yeah. and there's another sense is that there's clearly two world views, uh, if you notice, and again, this was this was historically true. Now, not to say that there were not believers in the Northern Army and the Union Army, but by and large, wherever the Union Army, and you see it when they, in, when they cross the river and shell and go in and destroy Fredericksburg, that they wage war against creation and yeah. against women and children. Right. And Right. And the and, and and the South did not. They protected women and children. In fact, when when uh, in the scene where uh, Jackson was being dispatched to Winchester and he was bidding his troops farewell, he commended them that they were not just defenders 
that they were protectors. Right, right. And and and, and that they had shown great great restraint and 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 uh, and not waged war against women and non combatants and, and and creation. So uh, uh, again, right out of the right out of Deuteronomy. Absolutely. In fact, I noticed in the movie he used the phrase that. Where he, he put it in the modern terminology of police officers. He said he was happy that they had shown themselves willing to both protect and serve. And I, I thought that was interesting. Right. Okay. Uh, yeah. Oh, oh, okay. Uh, well, it's just that as we're talking about transcendence, we're kind of naturally moving into point two where we talk about the hierarchy or in, in terms of the media, which character or characters tend to most represent the worldview that's being preached or the transcendence and and again it's it's no real contest there's stonewall jackson mainly uh robert e lee maybe a, in a little bit more minor role but they are clearly the representatives and uh, I just found that again refreshing that it's so out front and it's not it's not a topic to be mocked or made fun of, but it's just it's just uh, displayed for what it really was. And so I really and, and you see in, in the antagonist, which is Joshua Chamberlain, who went on to to receive the Medal of Honor for action at Gettysburg. Uh, you know, he's a religious professor from Maine. You know, of course. Uh, uh, New England uh, in those days in the 19th century was not a hotbed of evangelical sure. fervor. Yeah. But he's quoting, going into battle, he's quoting Julius Caesar. Right, right. Whereas right. Jackson is quoting Scripture. Uh, the, Old and New yeah. the Old and New Testament. Yeah, I thought it was interesting, too. There were a couple of times when Jackson made specific reference to uh, like narrative portions of the Old Testament, and he told his his juniors that they needed to study like first and second Samuel and the books of Kings in order to figure out how to write their battle reports and stuff like that. So he was, uh, and he was, uh, he was a reconstruction as they're applying scripture to all of life and, and finding. Right, and, I don't, and, yeah. and also uh, one thing, we don't want to take all the, all the goodies for the list for the, <laughs> those who watch it, but uh, he refers to the battles of uh, scripture uh, in his uh, discussion, in his meeting with Jeb Stewart, where he uh, he realizes that uh, uh, that uh, the politicians uh, were were too timid to to understand what war really is, and it really is a clash of worldviews, yeah. and uh, and that in, in Jackson's estimation, they should fight uh, in the same manner that the, that the armies of Israel fought, and that is to destroy the enemy to bring peace as quickly as possible. Right. It, that's the scene where he was talking about uh, fighting under the black flag. Am I, am I thinking right that, that that's yeah, what that yeah, meant? Right. That yeah. the symbolism there was uh, we're not intending to show anybody mercy. And, and <laughs> I thought that was pretty intense. <laughs> yeah, his goal was to bring the bring the, uh, the invaders to their knees as quickly as possible. Uh, right. To assuage the effusion of blood. Exactly. It wound up being the more uh, long-term, peaceful way to do things. Okay, so we've got Jackson, and, and in a lesser way, we have Lee representing the transcendent power. And then, like you said, uh, a couple of the northern generals tending to represent a false narrative. And... Uh, a, statist, a statist worldview. Sure, <laughs> right, and and even yeah, you mentioned it, and I would kind of forgotten it, but the the folks on the Northern Army were really they were kind of neo Romans in terms of while they'd have been right there with their pinch of incense for the genius of the empire, you know, they were they were full in. It seemed to me like. Right, and, uh, and of course, um, predominantly because there were a lot of Irish immigrants, uh, the percentage of Roman Catholics in the uh, Union Army was much higher. Oh, yeah. Uh, there, were few, there were a few Catholics in the South uh, as a percentage of the population, not many in the Army of Northern Virginia. Right. <laughs> and, 
although there were some in, of note in the Army of Tennessee, but uh, but one of the things you see, you, you really get the sense, and of course there are some, some really good hit, uh, books that our listeners can catch too, one of which is uh, Bennett's Christ in the Camp, which is the story of the great revival that took place in the Army of Northern Virginia during the war, oh. where it's estimated that over 200,000 conversions took place, oh, and uh, and that uh, these conversions were real. He, 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 he goes into great detail to, to, um, to, um, to uh, record the incident instances yeah. and specific conversions and the behavior of the troops and uh, also how the uh, chaplains work together. But you, you, one of the things you see in this movie is that prayer and the chaplains and the, um, the, the, the Christian banter, even naming their artillery pieces <laughs> after the four Gospels. Right. Uh, it's, it's very prevalent in, yeah. the, su- in the Southern culture. Yeah. And, and, and so while hey, these are, they're not perfect, they're not saints, there were ills and, and injustices that needed to be dealt with, but nevertheless, uh, this was a Christian army. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. I think that's right. And the movie does portray that really, really strongly. It was an amazing thing. Even compassion, even compassion for your enemy. Yeah, where you have the Irish, the Irish troops from Georgia, and then the Southern Army at Fredericksburg are, are, are cheering uh, for their fallen comrades on the other side, and are weeping and yeah. are weeping for them. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, that kind of leads me into one of the things that I wanted to talk about in in section three in the in the covenant. Section three is about ethics and kind of the rules. If you're going to be in this covenant, what do you, how do you keep the, what are your duties and responsibilities? And, and in media, kind of the question we ask is, does the, does the movie that we're talking about, does it highlight particular moral crisis that characters go through and, and how do they address those? And, and does the does their addressing of these moral crises is it consistent with the worldview that's been preached so far? And there were a few things like that. One of the things that I thought was interesting that would probably challenge modern people quite a bit was there was a, there were a couple of instances in which black men volunteered for the Southern Army and. Uh, you know, when they were asked, why are you doing this? Uh, kind of the answer was, well, this is my home and my home is being invaded and, and I'm going to I'm going to fight to protect what's mine. Uh, I thought that was a really interesting ethical discussion. Yeah, in fact, uh, the, uh, the star, the actor who played uh, Jackson's cook took a good bit of heat in his acting career and from the, commu- <laughs> the acting community as to why. He was even agreeing to play a role like that, and he, right. he he did doing some research on his own. He came to understand the motives behind the men that did, and, and it wasn't just, by the way, it wasn't just slaves attending their masters, right, uh, right. who were officers as 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 sort of aides to camp. But there were uh, there were estimated at as many at, through the course of the war, not all at one time necessarily, but as many as thirty thousand. Uh, blacks, and there were free blacks also in the South, and they, they were all slaves. Yeah, right. Uh, and, uh, but there were as many as 30,000 combatants that were African American or a uh, mixture of, of ethnicities that fought in the Southern Army. I think one of the interesting crises of ethics that occurs is in, in, the, in the demonstration of the impartial justice was yeah. when uh, right. uh, the son of, J- Jack- of Jackson's friend was apprehended at, and, and charged with desertion right. and found guilty. And how Jackson deals with that, not, you know, as a sin against the entire army, and uh, and, and they dispense justice impartially, and it's very, it, it seems very cold, and uh, but uh, but it is impartial justice, and I thought that was a, a bit of an ethical crisis that was dealt with in the, in the movie. Yeah, I, I thought that was a really powerful scene, mostly because of the actor. I thought he did a great job there because even as he's giving that speech that, like you said, seemed kind of cold and kind of 
harsh and and all of that. You could almost see it in his face a couple of times that he was in pain. You know, it, it's his emotions were going in the other direction, but he allowed his mind and his uh, his unwavering sense of what was right and wrong to guide him instead of you know yielding to what he felt like and so i thought that was really well done yeah duty is a duty is a big is a big theme yeah, in this movie right as it was as it was in throughout the war the fact that you know the uh you know obviously in the shooting most of the shooting is done in you know in pristine weather and everybody's got their uniforms in place because they're all reenactors but in actuality the privation the starvation, the hardships, the exposure, uh, the the pain, the suffering, the devastation of uh, that these men were living through was incomparable to us. Right, and we and inconceivable, and and yet duty was paramount. And uh, would that God's people had that that sense today? Oh, uh, yeah. oh yeah, absolutely, I agree with that. Uh, another, you mentioned the prayer, the kind of impromptu prayer meeting that Jackson had with his cook, and uh, after it's over, they're talking a little bit about the issue of slavery, and and that issue comes up a couple of times in the movie as well, and and I think you're right. I think I've heard you say that these were sincere Christian men, but they were kind of men of their time and men of their culture, and and kind of everybody has their blind spots, but I I felt like in that scene, you could see, well, from what Jackson said, it was plain that he knew slavery wasn't right, and he he said something like, I pray that the new Southern government will fix this and do the right thing, and and from the reading I've done historically, I believe that was a common attitude in the South. And Jefferson Davis kind of goes to some lengths to make the point that slavery was really on its way out. Uh, well, Jefferson, uh, uh, not not that this relates to the movie directly, right? Uh, but of course, Jefferson Davis, since you mentioned him, and actually him and his wife were actually uh, appointed guardians of a black child who was found on the street. He was a homeless child. Oh, wow. He'd been abused, and his name was Jim Limber, and and the, and the president of the Confederate government raised a black child, took him in, and raised him as one of his own children. Right. Uh, he was he was taken away from uh, Jefferson and Verena Jackson, uh, Davis rather, at the end of the war by Union troops, and he was never seen again. The interesting oh, wow. part about Jackson, and and why he really seems to be musing over this and and considering the words of his cook. And praying sincerely that God would show them the way out of this dilemma. You right. know, Jackson engaged Jackson engaged in civil disobedience throughout the war. He was a deacon in his local Presbyterian congregation there in Lexington, Virginia, where he yeah. had, had been an instructor at VMI. And throughout the war, he supported from his own payroll a school, a literacy uh, program for blacks. And at the time... It was against the law in Virginia to teach blacks to read. Oh, all right. And 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 Jackson funded that literacy program through his, from his own wallet nice. throughout the war, and uh, because he was convinced that they needed to be able to read the scriptures. And and Jackson is still uh, he's eulogized and and uh, and praised to this day. There's a congregation in Richmond, Virginia. A black congregation that has a uh, a stain a large stained glass window in their sanctuary dedicated to Stonewall Jackson, and they've been roundly criticized. And they answered the fact that this was a man who stood for justice against injustice. Yeah, right, right. Well, then, and I civil disobedience, which is interesting. Yeah, I didn't even know that that bit. I, you know, I read a biography of of him, but I had. It's been years. I don't. <laughs> I don't remember that piece, but that increases my respect for him for sure. Uh, another thing that you did mention: there was a scene before one of the big battles, and I, I told myself I was going to remember the name, and I don't remember which one it was. It was the one where Jackson had his men behind a big stone wall. The one you mentioned where 
Southern Irish were kind of forced to cut down their northern. That was Fre- that was Fredericksburg. Okay, so before and, and those were ja- and now those were Jackson's troops in that particular scene. Right, those were Longstreet's troops, but Jackson Jackson played a m- more of a minor role in the Battle of Fredericksburg, although you know it, it oh, wasn't okay. a minor battle. Yeah, uh, yeah. actually, uh, Fredericksburg, uh, the 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 Union. Uh, Frontal assault against the wall, the, the Murray's Heights in Fredericksburg. Uh, there were over a hundred and ten thousand yeah. federal wow. troops wow. involved in that assault. Wow. Well, what struck me is that what was the name of the Northern general again that that insisted on uh, running Burnside. his? Yeah, Burnside. So. Before the battle started, it was clear that he had his mind set that they were just going to keep throwing men at the wall, and he knew they were going to be under gunfire the whole time. And there was another scene where a couple of his lieutenants were talking about it, and they knew it was a completely doomed strategy and that they were going to get a, a tremendous number of their own people killed and uh, I was kind of struck in that time that that's when they really needed to, you know, know something about the doctrine of the lesser magistrates. They, that, you know, do you think, should they have just stood up and said, look, duty's one thing, but you can't just be throwing human beings into the jaws of death for no reason. Well, either. you don't hear, I, we're, the doctrine of the lesser magistrate, you don't hear that applied much in military yeah. spheres. It's more in your civil right. government in a military setting uh, you'd have to have that would be considered mutiny or treason it sure. would be a pun- right. punishable by death to uh, now uh, there is such a thing as resisting lawful orders Yeah, un- unlawful orders Burnside it wasn't that Burnside was just a uh, a uh, a uh, man who cared nothing about the well being of his men but he really had no choice he was thrust in there after there had already been uh, about four major uh, generals that had been put in command of the federal army uh, with uh, people like McClellan and uh, McDowell and uh, uh, Hood, uh, Hooker rather, and, 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 and Lincoln was looking for a man who would simply fight. Oh, and and oh, okay. and and, Burn, and Burnside was enough of a bureaucrat <laughs> that he was going. He would follow orders, and that was what that's what Lincoln was looking for, and yeah. and that's what brought and that's what brought about that huge loss of life is the fact that uh, they were dealing with a man who was basically a bureaucrat and who was following the dictates yeah. of the of the government authorities. Yeah, well, like you said, that that was just a really powerful scene where he had the. The Southern Irish weeping over the fallen Irish of the North, and uh, wow, that was just heartbreaking. Were there any other uh, ethical dilemmas that are on your mind to talk about? Mm, let me think. Come to mind. <laughs> uh. If not, that's fine. Then we can move on. Those were the, we covered the big ones that were kind of on my mind. Well, if you if you figure one out later, we'll I'll let you come back to it. But uh, we'll move on to point four, of the covenant, which is where I think it's going to get a little bit tougher to talk about. But point four is sanctions, and we talk about what are the rewards for f- being obedient to the covenant, and what are the punishments for being disobedient and do we see characters uh experience those things and it's a little bit tough to see i think burnside kind of winds up doesn't he kind of get some come up and sir i don't know I don't, he, gets, he gets replaced yeah <laughs> right <laughs> right for yeah. follow, basically for following orders yeah yeah, that's right. Uh, um, the, you just the unprecedented loss of life in that in, at the Battle of Fredericksburg. Um, well, I guess the 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 sanctions are is that uh, you know a fratricidal war, which is what that was, which 
many would many historians would say was wholly avoidable. Yeah, right. Uh, you know, um, I think you know the the sanctions uh, are we're still living through them. Oh yeah. Today. Yeah, exactly. Because because I, many would say that uh, in part, not in whole, but in part, the war was fought to prevent the consolidated central got all powerful government that right. was the result of the uh, defeat of the Southern Confederacy. Now I know there's going to be some some people who are going to think, well, you're just a neo Confederate <laughs> or a Southern nationalist, and, and uh, you know I confess to having tendencies in that direction. <laughs> but I don't. But I don't have any. I don't have any illusions about uh, you know the nobility of. A southern bureaucracy any more right. than I do a northern bureaucracy. Exactly. Again, exactly. again, this is not a story of this is not a story of causes. This is not a story of governments. This is a story of an army. Yeah. And the yeah. men and the men who did their duty and and, and, and trusted themselves to God, basically. Yeah, right. And the the bit of sanction that I think I saw was that in Stonewall Jackson you had a man who was obviously strongly devoted to God, strongly believed that if he if he trusted God in the performance of his duties as a general, that he was going to see victory and not defeat. And, uh, you know, as far as the movie goes, that's exactly what he got. You know, he trusted God and wound up routing the armies of the enemy. And uh, that's... And more, more, important, more importantly... He was victorious in death. Oh, sure. You know, right, when, right. When, he, when, he, when he was when he was told by his wife that Doctor McGuire, who was his personal physician, uh, expected him to die that day, uh, he he said, "I shall be the infinite gainer." <laughs> right. In other words, in other words, he he said, I, and, and it, he said, "I always good." He said, "I always hope to die on a Sunday." <laughs> you know, and, 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 you know, he was a Sabbatarian, of course. You know, uh, Jackson. Yeah. Yeah. Wouldn't wouldn't even would not even send a letter in the mail that would be in transit on a on a Sunday. Wow! All right. What, but what, what's what's interesting though is most of his battles were fought on Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, he did strike me though, and and maybe it's just because of other things that I've read or you know other ideas that are already in my head but he he did strike me as a guy that even if it wasn't sunday he was kind of living in sabbath rest regardless of what the circumstances were yes yes and uh you know he, he, there was a sense in which he there was a gusto and uh yeah he, and, 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 and he by the way he did sleep a lot he did rest in, in the midst, and he, he was often times that he was so exhausted from the rigors that he he, he would he could he would re, he would sleep all anywhere. Oh yeah. So yeah, he right. he was a man who had some tranquility. Um, <laughs> but, right. um, but I, I'd say that's fair to say though he there was he he lived in a in a sense of perpetual Sabbath rest. Right. And and, and again, he was a man of great idiosyncrasies idiosyncrasies too so <laughs> so I mean by, by today's standards by most of our our, our common uh, standards today he would be a, he would be somewhere to the far right of a covenanter oh wow yeah I think you're probably right yeah yeah I think you're right yeah so I I was kind of in the same place as, as what you mentioned when I was thinking earlier in terms of Sanctions. I was thinking, well, the movie would have to continue for a long, long time before we really started to see what the results were. And and like you said, I think that's right. We're still living in them. Well, now the Lord did. I mean, he did. Jackson. Uh, I'm trying to think of was he ever defeated? Uh, not really. He was never defeated in battle. Uh, Antietam, he was obviously just a corps commander. Uh, yeah. His most brilliant, his most brilliant campaign, the one that still studied, was called the his Valley Campaign of early 1862, where he had an ind independent command of an army of about uh, probably somewhere around fourteen to seventeen thousand, which is not a large number by the 
standards of the armies of that day. But he, with a with a force that small under independent command, he defeated three separate armies. Right. Right. In uh, in 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 sequence. So it's clear. Yes, God did. He, there there was a sense in which there was a divine favor that rested on this man. Yeah, when he I, was in. You know, uh, where where he was engaged, he he didn't lose. Right. I don't uh, think that's outrageous to to make that claim. I think that from everything I've read and seen, I think that's obviously true. And what's interesting too is that his enemies didn't kill him. No, that's right. <laughs> it was it was friendly fire. His enemies did not triumph over him. That's right. And then he and then he, he, he and then he died from pneumonia. Right, right. Peacefully in bed with his wife. Yeah, that was one of my favorite scenes when he was kind of despising the lemonade before he knew that she had made it, and, and then <laughs> and then later was talking about, no, this is great lemonade. <laughs> yeah. By the way, if you ever have a chance to visit Virginia, and uh, you ever go to Lexington and visit the grave site of, of of Jackson there in the cemetery in Virginia, you'll see that. Uh, People leave lemons for him. <laughs> they, they, they don't leave them. They're not leaving lemons for him. Obviously, he's not there. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, I remember when when my boys were when I my boys were young and we went on a trip out east. We visited the grave of Jackson and left and left lemons for him <laughs> on on the ground. It's just sort of a, a token, a, a, sure. a token of esteem. Of esteem. Yeah, but he yeah. loved he loved he loved lemons. <laughs> That's neat. He must have fallen in love with him while he was in Mexico. He did spend a yeah. lot of time there. Right. He liked he liked Mexico. And, yeah. And yeah. And wasn't his wife? Wasn't she from? Wasn't she a Mexican national? Uh, I I was kind of thinking. Don't, I don't know. Uh, I mean, obviously, he favored dark women, and he liked and 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 he liked uh, the Hispanic culture. He liked the Mexican. He liked these. He enjoyed his time in Mexico after the war. Right, right. So, uh, and he and he traveled. He traveled. He'd been to Europe, and and he yeah. was. Uh, and here's a man who did not who, who did not have a natural gift. He he, he didn't. Right. He wasn't a natural scholar. He persevered uh, by sheer determination. That's right. He was just diligent. He refused he to very, fail. He was very. He was yes. He was. He he attended uh, West Point in class of uh, 51, 1851. And he, he didn't even qualify for it for the basic admission. And, but what got in uh, when another fellow who had got a woman quit, and uh, and by just sheer grit and determination, <laughs> he, he 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 did well. Yeah. And and uh, but he was not a naturally gifted scholar. He was good in math, and he taught uh, he taught uh, physics, uh, what we call applied physics. And uh, logic and artillery, uh, uh, and he was and he memorized all of his lessons. Yeah, he, evidently, evidently he had a tremendous memory and he trained it. <laughs> he, uh, so he had memorized a lot of scripture, undoubtedly. Yeah, yeah, I think that's true. Obvious. Uh, okay, we should probably move along. Uh, point five of the covenant of this succession, and the question is, uh, in the movie, in the story that's told. What can we discern about the future? What do we see? And in the Bible, we talk about a, a lot about raising children and the new, next generation, and that's about succession. And I guess what I saw in the movie, if you had to, if you had to pinpoint su succession here, for me, I felt like it was, it was in all the people who were obviously affected and trained by Jackson. There's a sense in which he kind of replicated himself in a whole host of people that that followed him, and uh, and so extrapolating to the future, just as far as the movie goes, you can see he was going to have an effect on that whole region and and the culture there for a long time. Yeah, I think of it much like a, a Joshua. When Joshua died, then you had the period of the judges. Right. And men, and men did what was right in their own eyes. <laughs> right. And, and uh, you, you get a sense that with, with the passing of Jackson, uh, 
the that galvanizing, cohesive leadership, that moral example was was gone, and uh, from then on, everything was basically a, just a slow uh, unraveling. And 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 of course, he and in one scene, he, he's asked by General Hood. He said, "Do you think that you will?" survive the war and he said no sir I do not and if we are not victorious I don't think that I should wish to oh yeah in other words right, right. he had a he had a premonition that they were that that there were much larger uh, uh, issues at stake than the immediacy of their of their their way of life at that point they he, they he, he saw into the future in the sense that, uh, yeah. as, as some other, as others did, uh, uh, Claiborne said that you know one of the things that would result from uh, the South losing the war is that our children would be taught uh, a revised history by the by their conquerors. <laughs> right. Yeah, that hasn't happened at all. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Uh, well, good. Oh, I think I think you nailed it there. Uh, I think that brings us to the end of the Five Point Covenant, and, and then as a as a summary, I I feel like this is the most consistently portrayed Christian worldview that that we've had the pleasure of of uh, analyzing here on this podcast. So, thank you very much for recommending it. I'm glad I watched it. Well, yeah, I'd say short of maybe Chariots of Fire and a few other. Uh, obviously, there are some more recent yeah. films that have been made that are specifically by Christian studios. But, but yeah, I think uh, for a history movie, uh, I think it's uh, and it's and and it is. Uh, uh, I would give it high marks for you know for there's no, there's no profanity. Yeah. And uh, there's no nudity. <laughs> right. Uh, uh, and 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 even the violence is not gratuitous. No, but it's honest, you know, and uh, and I think there's value in that, especially the conduct of the warfare. Like we were saying, like Lee said, it's a good thing that that war is so terrible, or we'd learn to love it too much, or something. Uh, yeah, we less less fond of it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we gotta give this two thumbs up, Gordo. Yeah, I've got all my thumbs in the air right now. Two thumbs up for me. Well. So, uh, thank you, Bill. Thank you on behalf of the little audience of the Worldview Media Podcast. I appreciate the recommendation and then your willingness to come on here and, and do this with me. And uh, appreciate it, brother. And so... Always, always good to corroborate with you, Gordon. <laughs> and we just want to encourage our audience once again, uh, however it may be, to try to think covenantally about all the media that we get bombarded with and it really is in the in the little bits of media that we kind of blow off and don't think about very much that's where that's where cultural change happens without us even realizing it like we talked about Lee and Jackson being men of their time who had been in, influenced by their culture in maybe ways that they didn't they weren't even aware of that surely happens with us, and and part of the remedy is to uh, apply biblical eyes to everything that we see. And that's what we're trying to do here. And thanks again, Bill, for helping with that. And God bless everyone in the audience. And uh, semper reformanda in all things. Deo <laughs> vindicate. Yeah, there you go. What is what's the English translation for that? God will vindicate us. God will vindicate us. Very good. That's your left forearm or your right forearm? Well, that was the Latin inscription on the Confederate seal. <laughs> well, where I've seen it, it is on your forearm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Very good. God bless y'all. Thank you. We'll uh, see Bye. you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the Worldview Media Podcast. Please visit reconstructionistradio.com to check out the other podcasts in our network and to download our free audiobooks. <laughs>